Welcome to another episode of Cerebral Faith Live. I'm Evan Minton. Today we're going to be continuing our series on the problem of hell. If you like the video, like, leave a like and subscribe and turn on notifications so that you'll know whenever I have new video content coming out, whether it be a live stream or an upload. Um, gonna, I'm just going to share my screen. and dive into it. T today we are continuing our series on the doctrine of hell, um, and tonight we're going to be looking at what happens to babies who die. Um, we've already looked at uh, several objections to the doctrine of hell, objections that skeptics bring up to... Um, to argue that the doctrine of hell is incompatible with the goodness of God, um, that if God sends people to hell, then he's evil um, and not worthy of worship. Uh, in the first video in this series, we looked at why does God even send people to hell in the first place? And that sort of laid the groundwork for the rest of the, uh, of the series. And we spent three whole weeks, three whole episodes, talking about this one uh, this one objection, how could a good God subject people to endless and unimaginable torture for sins of finite severity? Uh, we saw that that uh, objection is not good because it is based on a false premise. The Bible does not teach that God will subject people to endless and imaginable torture for sins of finite severity. The Bible teaches that God will ultimately annihilate the lost. Um, the biblical evidence is overwhelming for that, and uh, the first uh, that was in part two. We looked at the positive evidence for annihilationism. And in part three, we looked at the counter evidence that traditionalists use against annihilationism, proof text for eternal torment. And then in part four, we looked at um, non-biblical objections to annihilationism. After that, we moved on and we talked about what I call uh, the problem of the unevangelized. You know, what, what about those who have never even heard of Jesus? That was last week's topic. And tonight we, we're moving on to this, this question. What happens to infants who die? Um, well, what happens to a baby who dies in infancy or uh, even sooner? What happens to a, a baby who dies in utero? Um, where do they go in the afterlife? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And then next week we will... Next week, we'll wrap up this discussion looking at the objection. I wish Canvas, I wish Canvas wouldn't, wouldn't do this. When I get to his, okay. uh, when I get my laser pointer down to the very bottom, it brings this up and it obscures things. Sorry. Uh, anyway, we're, uh, next week, we're going to finish this up with uh, why does, uh, what, why would God create people who he knew would reject him and end up in hell? But tonight, we're looking at this. What happens to infants who die? The CDC, Centers for Disease and uh, Centers for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has an article about infant mortality. They say, "quote about infant mortality. Infant mortality is the death of an infant before his or her first birthday. The infant mortality rate is the number of infant deaths for every one thousand live births." In addition to giving us key information about material and infant health, the infant mortality rate is an important marker in the overall health of a society. In 2018, the infant mortality rate in the United States was 5.7 deaths per 1,000 live births. And then it lists the, the various causes of infant mortality, such as birth defects, uh, preterm birth and low birth weight, maternal pregnancy complications, sudden infant death syndrome, and injuries, for example, suffocations. And then it gives the mortality rates by 2018. Um, and in 2018, um, this, is, this is the number of infant deaths per 1,000 live births. It says healthy people provides based, a science-based 10 years national objective for improving the health of all Americans. One of the Healthy people objectives is to reduce the rate of all infant deaths. In, two, in 2018, 11 states made the Healthy People 2030 target of 5.0 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. Geographically, 
infant mortality rates in 2018 were the highest in the South. And here's another chart. So babies die. <laughs> that uh, is an unfortunate fact. Um, and uh, babies who died in birth baby who died in utero uh that wasn't even counting that was a that wasn't even counting babies who were aborted in the womb that was just that was just about people who died post-birth so baby you know babies die so the question arises where do they go where do they go in the afterlife heaven hell purgatory um where where, where did they go well, uh, there are actually seven options in answering this. Uh, there are seven options that present themselves to us. Um, it is not just, it is not as simple as saying, oh, well, they all go to heaven or they all go to hell. Um, it's, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, the, I'm, I'm going to list the seven options. The first is infant damnation. All infants who die go to hell. The second option is all infants who die go to heaven. The third option is um, where they go depends on whether or not they were elect. This is the this is the Calvinist option. You know, if 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 God cho God chooses some babies to go to heaven, but He chooses other babies to go to hell. Um, the fourth option is uh, the babies aren't persons, and so they don't have souls, and so the question is a moot point. Uh, the fifth option is baby limbo. Option number six is a Molinist option, and that's uh, God judges them on whether they would have responded to the gospel if they had lived to, to adulthood. So th th this option is kind of like the, the where it depends on whether they were elect or not, except it has a Molinist flavor. It's like uh, if God knew that if this person were to live to 10, 15, 20 years old, uh, then they would have responded to the gospel. And so God lets them into heaven. But if they would not have responded to the gospel, then God sends them to hell. And he, and he judges them ba based on this counterfactual uh, knowledge, his middle knowledge. And then the last option, which, of course, this is going to come up when I put, bring my laser pointer down there. The last option is God puts them in a realm uh, where they where they become cognitively aware as. Um, you know, as someone who can make an informed decision so that they can and do make an informed decision either for or against God. So there's there's seven different options we're going to be looking at tonight. And I I find that only we're, we're going to reason we're go, what we're going to do is we're going to reason to the not we're not necessarily going to reason to the best explanation but we're going to reason to the least bad explanation um which i guess is the best explanation so let's look at these uh let's look at these options uh, the first option all infants who die go to hell um Robert B. Eno, uh, in The Fathers of the Church by Fulgent Fulgentis, uh, says, quote, Hold most firmly and never doubt that not only adults who, who, with the use of reason, but also children who either begin to live in the womb of their mothers and who die there or already born from their mothers pass from this world without the sacrament of holy baptism, which is given in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, must be punished with the endless penalty of eternal fire, even if they have no sin from their own actions. Still, by their carnal conception and birth, they have contracted the damnation of original sin, end quote. Now, I do not think that infant damnation is true, and I have a syllogism against why. One, God only sends people to hell if they have sins to be punished for. Two, Infants are literally incapable of committing any sin. Three, therefore, if God sent infants to hell, he would be punishing people who are undeserving of punishment. Four, punishing people who are undeserving of punishment is unjust. Five, therefore, either God is unjust or God does not damn infants. Six, 
God is not unjust. Seven, therefore, God does not damn infants. This is a logically valid syllogism, and in order for the conclusion to be reached, all we need to do is to establish the truth of the premises. So are these premises true, or are they false? Well, I think that premise one is pretty obvious. That's literally what the Bible teaches hell is about. Hell is to, to punish people for the, for the sins that they've committed. Um, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And, you know, as we saw in this series, the kind of death that that is, is a death of body and soul, Matthew 10, 28. It's a type of perishing that only unbelievers go. It is not a type of perishing that believers go, John 3, John 3, 16. Uh, believers don't perish in the way that unbelievers do. They have eternal life. But what about the second premise, that infants are literally incapable of committing any sin? Well, infants don't really have any opportunity to commit a sin. Think about all of the things that the Bible condemns as sin. Um, murder, adultery, theft, uh, idolatry, coveting, hating your brother in your heart, um, looking after a woman with lust. Um, it, it, just just think of just think of any sin and ask yourself can an infant do this can an, can a 1 year old murder exodus chapter 20 verse 13 i don't know about you but that would be quite a sight to see just to see the little tiny baby cr cr crawling over to a knife picking up the knife and then with his little teeny tiny baby leg and just jumping into the air and then just ramming the ramming the the knife into the into the adult's heart <laughs> like like someone from the survey corps <laughs> attacking a titan <laughs> no th this is absurd <laughs> can a one-year-old commit adultery that that's a sin exodus 2014 um no of course not um can a one can a one-year-old rape or steal Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Well, I mean, I suppose a baby could, you know, grab something that's not his in order to put it into his mouth, but that's not really some, that's not really an informed decision. Um, is that, does that really count as stealing? Can a baby blaspheme God? Blaspheming God is a sin, Matthew 12, 31. Or can a can a one year old get a divorce? Ma that's a that's a sin. Matthew five thirty two. Getting a divorce is is something God hates. Can can a can a baby do that? How about committing idolatry? Exodus chapter twenty verse three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yes, let's imagine a one year old baby just you know. Offering prayers at the altar of Baal or Asherah or Marduk. Oh, hail Marduk. Nah, I don't think so. What about um, coveting? Exodus twenty seventeen. Hate hating someone in their heart. First John three fifteen. What exactly can a can a uh, a one-year-old or a six-month-old do that God considers to be morally wrong. What? I can't think of anything. Nothing comes to mind. Um, I think the worst thing a baby could do is probably just be a little annoying, crying too loudly. That's about it. That's not really a sin, though. <laughs> uh, they poop too much. Uh, that's not really a sin. Um, yeah, thou shalt, thou shalt use the toilet. Thou shalt not poop or pee in thy pants. That's not a commandment from God. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't pee or poop in your pants, but God's not going to hold it against you. If you do, you're just going to be really weird and people aren't going to want to be around you. <laughs> uh, I can't think of anything a baby can do that God would consider a moral atrocity. So it seems the second premise is validated. 
Um, and so, given that the second premise is in uh, is validated, why would God send anyone to hell? The whole rationale for hell is to punish sinners for their moral crimes. Again, Romans six twenty three: the wages of sin is death. And see also Second Peter two six: infant damnation then is punishment of innocent people. Objection. St. Augustine comes in and says, excuse me, they are punished for Adam's sin. Uh, St. Augustine uh, pushed this idea that I'm sure you're aware of called original sin. And uh, I'm not going to get too ahead of myself, but he gets it from Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 21. Uh, this passage says, quote, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against any one account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the disobedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin is increased, grace, grace is increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. End quote. Now. What Augustine took from this passage is all people are held accountable for Adam's sin. Um, but there are, there are two different kinds of original sin. One is the inherited guilt view, which I just, which I just uh, explained. It's the view that all people uh, are held not only for their own individual sins that they commit during their lifetime, but also... They're commit. They're held accountable for Adam's sin, or original sin, and so the the people who hold the infant damnation do so. They would say, yes, the baby, you know, the the one year old or the six month old or the two month old, is not. He's not held accountable for any sins that he did. He's but he is stained by original sin. So he's held accountable for what Adam did in the garden. 6,000, 10,000, 50,000 years ago, or if William Lane Craig is right, uh, 700,000 years ago. Um, so there's that. But there's also the view that, no, we're not held accountable for Adam's sin, but we do inherit our sin nature from him. This is what I call the inherited depravity view. And of course, the the proponents of the inherited guilt view also believe that we inherit uh, our, our sinful nature from Adam and Eve, uh, but they, they hold that we're held accountable for Adam and Eve's sin as well. Uh, the inherited, the, the second option says, no, we're not held accountable for his, uh, for his action, but we are stained by his sin because we have a corrupt nature that we got from our parents and they got from their parents all the way going back uh, to the garden. But is, is, which one is true? Is it, Inherited guilt or just inherited depravity? What is Romans 5 talking about? Whoops. Looks like I forgot to hit the, the next button when I was giving my explanation. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, okay, two alternatives of Romans 5. Here, the, these are two alternative readings of the passage 
that don't conclude that we inherit Adam's guilt. And by the way, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the live chat and I will get to them during the Q&A portion. Um, I don't interact with the live chat during the live streams because I, I can't do two things at once. I'm very bad at, at multitasking. So I'm just going to focus on the on the live stream. But as you come up with your with your questions for the Q&A portion, just uh, type them in the live chat. So anyway, two alternative alter interpretations of Romans 5 that don't conclude we inherit Adam's guilt. The first is Paul is describing a chain reaction of sin, inherit uh, of sin, inheriting a sin nature, and sinning as a result of that nature, which brings about death. And this is the view that I advocate for uh, on my blog, on the Cerebral Faith blog. The second option is is that all all Paul is saying is that Adam corporately got us barred access from the tree of life, and ergo, none of us can be immortal. That's the view that Michael Heiser defends. Um, of course, neither of these are mutually exclusive. They can both, they both could be true, but um, these are two alternatives. Now, in my blog post, uh, my, my take on the doctrine of original sin that I published on the Cerebral Faith blog back on October 4th, 2013, that was back before I switched to WordPress. That was back when I was still on a blogspot platform. I wrote, quote, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. This passage says that because Adam and Eve sinned, they were infected with an illness, if you will, a sin nature. And because of this, when Adam and Eve uh, reproduced, their sinful nature was passed on to their children. And this nature was passed on to Cain and Seth's children. Seth is Adam's youngest son. And this sin nature was passed on to their children, and so on. Adam's children sinned, and then their children sinned, and then their children's children sinned, and so on and so forth. This sin nature keeps getting passed on to each new generation. When I have kids, this same sinful nature will be passed on to them. At the end of the verse, Paul says that all men die, not because of what Adam did, but because of what they did and what we do. Of course, the only way to get redeemed is to accept Jesus' substitutional death on the cross for our sins. Those who reject Christ will not have Christ registered as their substitute, the one who took up the penalty for their sins uh, himself. Instead, he will have to suffer for his own sins in hell. In one sense, though, I guess you could say we are sent to hell because of what Adam did. Since we have our sinful nature and tendencies to fall into immorality because of what he did, we have our sinful nature because of Adam's sin. We sin because we have a sin nature. We die because we sin. So there's like a causal chain in effect. Adam's sin, Adam obtaining a sin nature. All of Adam's descendants having a sin nature. Adam's descendants sinning. Adam's descendants going to hell for their sins. So yeah, here's the here's the the causal here's the chain reaction. Adam sins, he gets a sin nature, and then Adam and Eve procreate, and they have Cain and Abel, and they have a sin nature that both of them they they have the sin nature that Adam developed. It developed de novo in him with his rebellious act. Uh, then they they sin, you know. In Cain's case, he killed his brother Abel. And Seth and Cain, you know, they have, they have, they reproduce and then they re, they pass their sinful nature on to the next generation and then they sin and so on. And so spiritual death, um, you know, the wages of sin is passed on to all people because all sin. Why do all people sin? Because all people have a sin nature. Why do all people have a sin nature? Because all people are descended from Adam, and we inherited our sinful nature from Adam. So it is in this way that Adam's sin brought death to us all. Adam sins, Adam gets a sin nature, Adam's descendants inherit his sin nature, 
Adam's descendants sin because they have a sin nature. Adam's descendants have children and pass on their sin nature. Those children give in to their sinful nature like their parents and sin. Adam's descendants sin because of their sin nature. Adam's descendants have children and pass on their sin nature. Those children give in to their sinful nature like their parents and sin and, you know, and so on. And therefore, Adam's descendants die, i.e. are annihilated in hell because of their sins. This cycle continues from generation to generation. It is in this way that Adam's sin brought death to us all. Except for, you know, th those uh, who repent and place their faith in Christ and obtain eternal life and have our sins cleansed by the blood of Christ. But even we, that would be our fate unless we came to Christ. Now, here is the second alternative interpretation to Romans 5. Michael Heiser uh, alludes to this in episode 118 of his blog post, The Naked Bible Podcast. And by the way, we found out, if you don't know, he posted on his Facebook page that his pancreatic cancer is operable and it has not spread. And so it looks like he's going to be okay. But continue to keep him in your prayers. But anyway, but anyway Dr. Heiser said, quote, since I don't hold that view of Romans 5.12, and of course other people don't, we don't believe that, that Adam's guilt was transferred to everybody else because of what he did. It's about something else. If you're new to my take on Romans 5.12, go up to the website, drmsh.com, and just put in Romans 5.12, and you're going, to, you're going to find what my view is. But Romans 5.12, the way I parse it, means that everybody dies. Humanity is mortal. They are removed from Eden because of what Adam and Eve did. But they're not guilty. They suffer the fallout, pardon the pun. They suffer the consequences, but not because God charges them with guilt. It's just that they're caught up in what happened. They're affected by it. But it doesn't make them individually guilty for what somebody else did. You're guilty because of what you do, not because of what somebody else did, end quote. On the Naked Bible blog, the, the blog post that Heiser alluded to in the podcast titled uh, The Naked Bible Blog, Romans 5.12 and the Fate of the Unborn Infants and Other Human Beings Who Cannot Believe from Birth, posted on July 29, 2009, Dr. Heiser wrote, quote, let's first look at verse 22. Adam's sin resulted in death, just like Romans 5.12 says. It doesn't say it resulted in guilt. And in parallel thought, because of Christ's resurrection, all shall be raised. Death was conquered by Christ, Romans 6, 9, for example, and Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. But what of the other language, the eschatological talk of resurrection and death? That's important, too. And the rest of the passage summarizes day of the Lord theme is found in a number of other passages, resurrection, judgment, the kingdom, etc. We need to unravel this a bit. If we turn to Revelation 20, the great, great white throne passage, we read of two resurrections. Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 to 6. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Dr. Heiser butts in and says there's resurrection number one. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. And then he butts in and says there's resurrection number two. This is the first resurrection, MSH. This, the this refers back to the primary focus of the passage, the resurrection of the martyred believers. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years, end quote. Um, then then we, uh, he points our attention to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, which says, quote, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, 
and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Dr. Michael Heiser goes on to write, quote, looking at the passage, we read first that books, plural, were opened. But then another book, singular, the book of life, was opened. The, the dead were judged by the plural books according to what they had done. Books that recorded their sins, a record of their guilt before God. That record was the basis of suffering the second death, hell. These people were still in their sins and trespasses, as Paul would say. However, all that was necessary to avoid the second death was to have one's name written in the book of life. The one, uh, that one wasn't about works. There, there is no work salvation. All that mattered was inclusion in the book. If you had sinned and had never received Christ, you were in the bad book. If those conditions didn't apply to you, you weren't in the bad book. If you had never incurred moral guilt and had never rejected Christ, you weren't in the bad book. Since moral innocence never sinned and never rejected Christ, they never had the opportunity, nor could they actually believe something that takes a brain, confer the conceptus or fetus here, and a brain functioning at a certain capacity, confer infants, retardation, and even toddlers here. They are not written in the bad book. They can only be in the other book. We aren't told of a third, end quote. So that is, uh, those are the two options. And I must say, I kind of lean towards the second option now. We die because of Adam's sin, because Adam sinned, he got kicked out, and we no longer, we can no longer get out. We don't even know where the Garden of Eden is. But even if we did, what would we find? We'd find a cherub with a flaming sword there. And I don't know about you, but I'm not taking on that guy. <laughs> not even if I had an AK-47. He could probably just move at light speed and just deflect all the bullets like something out of an anime. Uh, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> we, we can't get back in there. And so we're going to grow old and we're going to die. But thank, thanks to Jesus, uh, we will be raised from the dead and be made immortal. So we don't. You know, I'm, we don't need the tree of life. In fact, Revelation says the tree of life is going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And I believe that the tree of life is symbolic of Christ, but I'm not going down on a rabbit trail there. But yeah, I kind of lean more towards Heiser's view now than the, you know, the chain reaction view that I that I used to, to hold. But nevertheless, I wanted to include both views. Um, and, and so you, you can make up your own you can make up your own your own mind, which of these alternatives to the inherited guilt to the Augustinian interpretation you find um, most plausible. Um, this is important. I, I think we really need, I think churches really need to stop this, this whole, they need to not preach infant damnation and they need not to preach um, original sin, which is really the only basis there is for infant damnation. I don't see how anybody who would ever pose that were it not for this theological idea. William Edward Hartpole Lecky in uh, Rationalism in Europe says, quote, nothing indeed can be more curious, nothing more deeply pathetic than the record of many ways in which the terror-stricken mothers attempted to evade the awful sentence of their church. Sometimes the baptismal water was sprinkled upon the womb. Sometimes the stillborn child was baptized in hopes that the Almighty would antedate the ceremony. Sometimes the mother invoked the Holy Spirit to purify his immediate power, the in, by his immediate power, the infant that was to be born. And sometimes she received the host or obtained absolution and applied them to the benefit of her child. For the doctrine of the church had wrung the mother's heart with an agony that was too poignant for even that submissive age to bear, end quote. Ideas have consequences. Good ideas have good consequences, and bad ideas have bad consequences. Let's not make a mother's grief more severe than it already is, shall we? Objection. Now, here's another objection. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 says, Thou shalt 
not bow down to uh, bow down thyself to them nor serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god visiting the iniquities of the father upon the children uh, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me end quote king james version um they argue that hey uh this says that god punishes the the children for their for what their fathers did even to the third and fourth generation of those who hate them so uh, and they use this to, to bolster the idea of the inherited guilt view. But first of all, this verse doesn't have anything to do with Adam. It doesn't have anything to do with Adam, Adam's, Adam's sin, or Adam's descendants. The most you can draw from this verse is that God will punish idolaters. That's the context of the passage. You know, that this is verse 5. Verse 3 was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, the most you can draw from this verse is, is that God will punish idolaters' descendants to the third and fourth generation, not all people who, who have sinned in the history of mankind under the third and fourth generation. And even then, it's only under the third and fourth generation. What about the fifth and sixth generation? I don't, But I don't even think that God is saying that, that the children... Even the children of idolaters are held guilty for what the parents did. Um, here, I think we do have something more like the chain reaction. Uh, the parents are setting up a chain of events for which the children will bear consequences in the future. It is like if a man gambles his farm away, the children will bear the consequences. It is very plausible that God is saying that the children to the third and fourth generation will suffer from the fallout of the judgment. And we actually see this happening in the biblical history, that the Babylonian ex exile. I'm sure there were many, I'm sure there's were many good Israelite children and babies who were not responsible for sacrificing to Molech and, um, and Baal and all of the sins that the Israelite prophets ac accused them of, uh, which was the reason for God sending the Babylonians to you know, destroy their their nation. They killed many people, and they took a lot of people hostage back in into the Babylonian into Babylon, held them captive for seventy years. I'm sure that there are people that there were children who went from Israel to Babylon and lived in Babylon for seventy years, who did nothing to deserve that. It's in that way that I think God punishes, um, visits the inequity of the fathers upon the children into the third and fourth generations. The third and fourth generation, you know, having to uh, suffer the consequences of bad choices that they made, or even judgment upon, you know, a family or a nation for, for what they did. Another objection is that Psalm 51.5 says we're all born in inequity. Psalm 51.5, this is uh, David's psalm of repentance after he had killed Uriah in order to cover up his um, affair with Bathsheba because, you know, he did the, the hanky-panky with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and he was like, oh, no, Uriah hasn't been home for a while. People are going to know that people are going to know that she's been sleeping around and it's probably mine because she's been hanging, she's been spending a lot of time at the palace. And uh, I got to do something. Uh, and so he has him killed. And therefore Uriah is, uh, Bathsheba is free and she takes him. Uh, he takes her. And uh, God's not happy about that. And so Nathan comes, gives him the whole, par the whole parable with the lamb. Uh, and David repents. And this psalm is... Is a, is a result of that repentance, his, his broken and contrite heart. And in verse 5, he says, quote, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. End quote. Passages of the uh, original sin and heritage guilt view will say, this verse proves that. You see, the psalmist says he was, born, he was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin his mother conceived him. Well, there are two ways to interpret Psalm. 51 5 well the first is that we were born guilty before god the second is is that we were just simply born with a sin nature there's actually a third 
way to interpret Psalm 51 5 that has that is not either of these alternatives. But I didn't include it because I can't I just can't remember what it is. Um maybe you maybe someone can leave it in the comment section. But here are at least here here is at least another way of interpreting that. And that's just you know, brought forth in an egg, born uh, conceived with a sin nature, not born guilty, but just born with a sinful nature. Uh, if the second is the case, babies won't need to go to hell. There's a difference between sinning and having a disposition to sin. Another objection, another ar argument is sola dea gloria, sola dea gloria, baby. Now, I am going to be honest with you. I did not come up with this on my own. And what you see in the, in the little speech bubble there is a genuine copy-pasted quote from a conversation I had with a Reformed person in a, in a Facebook group several years ago. I think it was, I think it was like, I think I had just moved to the house I'm currently living in. When, when I had this conversation, I just couldn't believe it. He said, brace yourself, and I quote, a baby is not only capable of sinning, but he does nothing but sin, as all of his or her actions and thoughts prior to regeneration have nothing to do with bringing God glory, end quote. No, no, I did not respond. I did not respond to him. Are you high? But I don't. But would I have really been out of line if I did? <laughs> Are you high? What? A baby is not only capable of sinning, but he does nothing but sin, as all of his or her actions and thoughts prior to regeneration have nothing to do with bringing God glory. Well, besides the prima facie absurdity of this response, there are actually some real theological pitfalls that this kind of reasoning brings you into that I think we as Orthodox Christians want to avoid. Um, well, before I get into those, uh, first let me ask the question, how can you be expected to glorify God if you don't even know who God is? Ought implies can. Um, If you are, if I expect you to do something, I, I am presupposing that you have the ability to carry out the task that I am asking you to do. If you had uh, both of your arms chopped off, I would not ask you to hug me and, I, and then, uh, and then uh, chastise you for not hugging me. You don't like me. You don't want to give me a hug. Yeah, you're... Why Why do you hate me? I would not do that because you obviously have no ability to hug me. You have no arms in this scenario. Um, if, if you are out, if you are at the grocery store and your wife gives you, a, sends you a text message uh, telling you that they you need that you need more peanut butter. You need to pick up some peanut butter, but you don't have your cell phone. Your cell phone went dead. Uh, your cell phone went dead while you were in the store, so you cannot retrieve it. Would it be reasonable for her to give you a tongue lashing when you get home for not getting the peanut butter? If I mean, assuming that she knows your phone went was dead and and couldn't you couldn't answer it. No, ought implies can. How can a baby be held responsible for glorifying God when they they don't even know who God is? They have they can't they can't know who God is. They have to know a language. They have to learn a language before they can learn uh, the gospel. At least one. They don't have to learn a lot. They just have to learn one. They have, you know, they have to, whether it be English, Spanish, Greek, Hebrew, Portuguese, Klingon, they have to learn a language in order to understand propositional co uh, content. Uh, so, no, uh, God would be very, very unreasonable 
uh, to hold infants accountable for not glorifying him the moment they pop out of the womb. Moreover, this reasoning entails that Jesus was a sinner. Jesus, as we cover, if you were here for the um, the talk, is the doctrine of the incarnation logically coherent? We 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 saw how um, the Gospels depict Jesus as having finite knowledge. He had a he had a normal human consciousness. Luke two fifty two says he grew in wisdom and stature. Uh, Mark thirteen thirty two, Jesus said that he didn't know the day or hour of his coming. Um, and what we we're wrestling with in that episode of Cerebral Faith Live as well. If Jesus is God and God is omniscient, then how can Jesus not know some things? And I posited the answer that William Lane Craig does is that um, all of Jesus's knowledge from everything from auto mechanics to quantum mechanics was in the back of his mind. It was in his subconscious. We all know in our in our own sub, in our own experience that we know some things in our subconscious. But we can't access that knowledge. Maybe you see the name of some, maybe you see the name of a celebrity and you you know that you know his name, but you just can't put your finger on it. You're like, I know him. I know his name. It it start. I think it starts with the letter C. Is it Chad? Is it um, Chum? Uh, what, what is it? Uh, uh, and maybe you need to Google the movie that he was in, the movie that you're watching. And you find out, oh, yeah, his name is... Um, uh, his oh, his name doesn't start with the letter C at all. It, it's this is Chris Evans. Oh wait, no, that is that is a C. <laughs> no, I I'm, I'm sorry. I meant I meant to go with another celebrity, but my mind my my mind pulled a switcheroo on me. <laughs> so it actually did come out with the C. I, I meant I meant to say Robert Downey Jr. I was thinking of the Captain America versus the Civil War meme. <laughs> so I had a, anyway uh you know we all know um in our subconscious experience uh you may you may see robert downey jr like his name starts is is that is his name start with a c what is his name oh no it's robert downey jr yeah i know i knew his name i just i had to google him in order to remember um but yeah, you know, if you want to learn more about that, go watch the 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 live stream. Is the doctrine of the incarnation incoherent? But Jesus had a, a normal human consciousness. He did not, as the the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas uh, depicts, he did not come out of the womb speaking speaking words of wisdom uh, in uh, Hebrew. Um, so, if Jesus had a normal human consciousness, could Jesus glorify God in the way that this interlocutor of mine expects expects babies to be? Uh, and I, I think not. And if so, according to him, does, does that mean that Jesus is a sinner? Hebrews four fifteen says we don't have a high priest that we have a high priest that suffered in every way that uh, you know he was tempted in every way that we were, yet was without sin. And in John's gospel, Jesus rhetorically asks, "Who, which one of you can accuse me of sin? Uh, implying that no one can. Does he want to impugn the goodness of the sinlessness of Jesus? That Jesus wasn't sinless until he was at least three years old or two years old? I don't think you, I don't think we want to go. I don't think we want to go there. So, yeah, that's the. That was a long way of defending the second premise. Uh, the, the rest of the premises in this argument against infant damnation, I think, are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, I think we can all agree that if you punish someone who is undeserving of, I think, you know, given this, then, then this. This is, in fact, this is not a this is not a premise. This is a conclusion. And four, punishing people who are undeserving of punishment is unjust. I think we can all agree with that. And this is not. This is just, um, yeah. The rest of the the rest of the the rest of the the only really controversial premise is two. I, I would think. I don't know. Maybe maybe one of you guys just disagrees with premise four. Maybe you think it's entirely okay to punish someone who is undeserving of it, or maybe you think uh, 
maybe you, maybe you think God sends sinless people to hell. Uh, but I, I, I think most of us would agree with most of the premises and we have a problem with two. So step three follows from step one to two via modus ponens. Seven follows from five to six by disjunctive syllogism. Five follows from three and four. Now let's examine option two. All infants who die go to heaven. Uh, the first, this seems like uh, the best view, doesn't it? I mean, it seems, you know, hey, they, they all go to heaven. Uh, I used to, to share this view, but I, I realized that it has problems. Uh, the first problem <clears throat> is that in, if, this, if this automatic infant salvation view were true, infants would enter eternal love relationships with God without making a free choice. Uh, in Tim Stratton wrote in his blog post, "What about babies who die?" on free think on the Free Thinking Ministries blog that quote, "If that infant automatic infant salvation is the case, then wouldn't it be good for God to keep all humans in a mental state in which they could not make free and informed decisions to morally sin here on earth? If God did that, then He could have His desired universal salvation." First Timothy two four, Second Peter three nine. Moreover, these infants would be forced into a state of affairs against their will or lack of will. That is to say, they had no choice in the matter. If that is the case, it seems that these little ones would never be able to say yes to God's eternal marriage proposal. It seems they are missing out on a vital piece of maximal love, end quote. Now, because I'm going a little long here, I am not going to go on the refresher course on why forced love is uh, not love at all. You can just go back and watch part one of this Hell series where I give the robot illustration uh, and I also quote Tim Stratton's uh, article on the Joker and Harley. And um, yeah, I think I think in order for love to be genuine, it needs to be freely given. And in order to be freely given, you need to have the ability to choose not to love. So that's that's the problem. The problem is is that pretty much everybody ends up. Uh, everybody who dies in infancy or in utero ends up with an automatic relationship with God without having to make a free choice. And as I argue in part one, God cares about that because, you know, I give some arguments for why coerced love or causally determined love is not true. And you can go check that out. But I'm running on 53 minutes here and I've only just gotten to the second option. So I, I'm not going to go through that. But the second problem is that it would seem as though abortion is doing the unborn a favor since you guarantee their eternal life. Now, I don't really think that this is a problem. I think the, I think the first one is a problem, but I write in my book, A Hellacious Doctrine, a defense of the biblical doctrine of hell, um, that, quote, there are several problems with this argument. First of all, it's true that you'd be doing fetuses and infants a favor by killing them because they would go to heaven and that but but then uh no first of all if it's true that you'd be doing fetuses and infants a favor by killing them because they would go to heaven then why wouldn't it also be the case that killing adult christians is morally permissible for the for exactly the same reason after all if someone cut me down right now my soul would go to heaven i'd be with jesus uh, if whether or not it's okay to kill them hinges on their eternal destiny, that logically entails that it's okay to kill adult Christians. However, no one would say that it's okay to kill adult Christians simply because they would go to heaven if they died. But if it isn't okay to kill adult Christians on that basis, why would that basis make it okay to kill fetuses and infants? Now, one might object, okay, that's a good point, but the situation is slightly different with babies than it is with fully grown Christians. This is because we've been sending them straight to heaven, but this would include babies who have rejected Jesus if they would have grown into adulthood. The problem, though, is that a parallel argument could be made about adult Christians who apostatize. What if some Christian would turn away from, from Christ if he were allowed to live, but by killing him, you one prevents his backsliding? Of course, this presupposes that the doctrine of eternal security is false. But the point here is supposed to be that if eternal, if eternal security were false in a possible world where true believers lose their, lose their salvation, would it be the case that you'd possibly be doing the grown Christian a favor like you'd be doing for the infant? It seems bizarre to me that whether or, whether or not killing adult Christians is permissible hinges on whether the doctrine of eternal security were true. 
By the way, for those who aren't aware of the term, eternal security is the belief that once a person gets saved, they'll always be saved. They'll never revert back to a state of being unsaved. Secondly, this objection fails to take into account the sovereignty of God and his commandments to us. The Bible explicitly tells us not to murder innocent people. See Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. God tells us not to kill another human being. This is one of the Ten Commandments. As such, abortion and infanticide are both moral abominations. They're evil. It is evil to kill a baby or anyone else for that matter. Now, now God is the author of life, and as such, he has the right to take life as he sees fit. See Job chapter 1, verse 21, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, Psalm chapter 75, verse 7, and Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. God has a right to decide when we entered the afterlife, we do not. Since he's the author of life, he has the right to take it. The Bible even says that God has ordained the date of our deaths. See Job chapter 14, verse 5, and Psalm chapter 139, verse 16. Therefore, only God can decide when a fetus or an infant comes into the afterlife, not us. We are human beings. We are not the author of, authors of life. God is. Whenever a human being takes a life, he is putting himself... Uh, in the place of God. God is the author of life, and therefore only he has the right to take it. Therefore, killing babies is a moral evil, regardless of whether they'd end up in the afterlife. Thirdly, God has a plan for every human life. It's true that if everyone had an abortion or killed their infants, that they would send them to heaven, but they would also be like uh, likely radically altering the future for the worse. Yes, they, the babies, would be far happier in heaven than they uh, ever would be living in this horrible world, but God has plans for those babies. Each human being radically affects the lives of those around them, and this was beautifully illustrated in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Each human life affects the lives of those around them, either for the better or for the worse. Think about the, consequ the possible consequences of ending the life of an unborn child. That child might have become a firefighter who would have saved many lives in a burning building. One of those lives being that of a child who would grow up to be a police officer, and the police officer would save the life of a child from a serial killer, and the child saved from the serial killer would grow up to be a scientist who discovers the cure for blindness or cancer or something. By ending the life of that unborn baby, yes, you'd be sending them to heaven, but you would also rob the world of a great gift. In this illustration, you would prevent the cure for blindness being discovered. If only you chose not to have an abortion. Or even worse, uh, what if the child would grow up to be the next Billy Graham? In this case, hundreds or thousands of souls who would have been saved actually end up damned because the child wasn't able to grow up and become a preacher. So yeah, you sent that child to heaven, but at the same time, you ended up sending far more people to hell because perhaps the only possible world where these people would have given their lives to Christ is a possible world where that unborn baby grows up and holds Billy Graham types crusades. Would you really want to risk the souls of hundreds or thousands just to send one person to heaven? And quote, Option three, where they go depends on if they're elect or not. John Calvin put forth this alternative in his Institutes, Book 4, Section 17. Calvin writes, quote, But how, they ask, are infants regenerated when not possessing a knowledge of either good or evil? We answer that the work of God, though beyond the reach of our capacity, is not therefore null. Moreover, infants who are to be saved, and that some are saved at this age is certain, must without question be previously gener regenerated by the Lord. For if they bring innate corruption with them, <coughs> excuse me, from their mother's womb, they must be purified before they can be admitted into the kingdom of God, into which shall not enter anything that defileth. Revelation twenty one seventeen. If they are born sinners, as David and Paul affirm, they must either remain unaccepted and hated by God, or be justified. End quote. And he also wrote in uh, his Institutes of Christian Religion, Book Three. Uh, chapter 23, paragraph 6, that, quote, individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death and are to glorify him by their destruction, end quote. On this Calvinistic view, some babies go to heaven, others don't. It all depends on whether God wants that baby or not. I have written and podcasted extensively on why deterministic tulip Calvinism is false. I've also blogged extensively about why deterministic tulip Calvinism is false. And I've actually persuaded a few, a, a few Calvinists to uh, give up Calvinism. So that's nice. For now, suffice it to say uh, that a good God would not send anyone to suffer the eternal holocaust of hell for a choice that they were powerless to make.
thank God that Calvin was wrong and this view of Calvinism is uh, is false. God does not need babies burning in eternal fires of hell to receive glory. The cross was enough. Thus, I reject this hypothesis. Option four, babies aren't persons, so they don't go anywhere. This view avoids the problem by rejecting the idea that babies have souls. Babies, they're not going to either paradise or Hades, heaven or hell. They're not going anywhere. They're not persons. In his article, What Happens to Babies Who Die, Tim Stratton argued that based on biology, we know that at the moment of conception, we have a complete, unique, living human being in the mother's womb. He says to, he says to consider the following, quote, from the uh, complete, from the moment of fertilization, the preborn child is complete. All the genetic information that needs to be there is there. It simply needs time to grow. Unique. The scientific evidence of DNA proves that the preborn child is unique and genetically distinct from his or her mother. The preborn child is not a part of the mother, like an appendix, but a unique entity inside his or her mother. Living. The laws of biology tells us that the preborn child is alive because it is growing, developing, and undergoing metabolism and responding to stimuli. Human, the scientific law of biogenesis states that living things re reproduce after their own kind. So dogs beget dogs, cats beget cats, goldfish beget goldfish, and humans beget humans, not parasites or blobs of cells, but humans, but humans, complete and unique living human beings, end quote. So that option is off the table. Well, what about option five, baby limbo? No, not this kind of limbo. Some argue that babies go to neither paradise nor Hades, but instead go to a sort of limbo where they are cognitively infants for all eternity. I find this option really bizarre a realm where people stay infants for all eternity, unable to grow, unable to learn anything, unable to know that they're loved by God? Why would God do this? This is a strange hypothesis that I think we ought to reject. Option six, God judges them on whether they would have responded to the gospel if they had lived to adulthood. This is uh, basically, a mo as I said, a, a Molinist option, uh, a Molinist spin on option three. God elects babies on the basis of his middle knowledge. He knows that if they would have positively responded to the gospel, had they grown to adulthood, um, they'll go to heaven. And if they, if he, if he, if God knows if they had rejected the gospel, had they grown to adulthood, uh, then he will condemn them. Uh, he doesn't judge he doesn't judge them on the basis of what they actually did, but on the basis of what they would have done under other circumstances. Now I find this to be very problematic. For God to judge me on the basis of what I would have done in other circumstances opens a counterfactual can of worms. I mean think about the endless possibilities of what I, I might have done or I might do if I were to find myself in some circumstance that I never actually will find myself in. Like, for example, let's say, okay, Godwin's Law is about to take effect, but let's say that I was born in the 1930s or, the you know, I was uh, coming of age in the 1940s in Germany. Maybe in such a circumstance, I would have become a Nazi. Um, I am not a Nazi, and I never will become a Nazi, but maybe if I had grown up in Germany in the 19, you know, 1930s, 1940s, you know, around the time that Hitler was rising to power, if, you know, maybe, or what if I, what if I, what if I were in Judas Iscariot's circumstances? What if I would? What if I would have betrayed Christ? I don't know if I would have done that or not. Maybe I would have. Maybe I wouldn't have. Um, you know, the the options are just pretty much endless. 
Is God going to hold me accountable for betraying Christ for 30 pieces of silver in some non-actual feasible world? Is God going to hold me accountable for being a Nazi in the 1940s? Are those things I'm going to have to answer for on Judgment Day? It's just, it just opens up a can of worms. And the same can be said for all of us. What would you have done in some circumstance? You know, there might be some circumstance in which you're a murderer. Uh, you know, th there might be some circumstance in which you um, commit the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, whatever that might be. I have no idea what that is. Uh, I've looked at all of the options, and all of the interpretive options have holes in them. I have no idea what it is, but, uh, you know, whatever it is, what if there's some circumstance in which you would have committed that sin? Is God going to hold you accountable for the unforgivable sin that you never actually committed, but you would have committed if you had found yourself in some circumstance? I don't think we want to go down this road. This This is not... Let's keep that, let's, let's, let's put the lid back on this. Finally, option seven. This is the, this is where I have landed and this, uh, this is where Tim Stratton has landed. I've landed here, um, largely in part because of Tim Stratton, uh, and his blog post that I've quoted, uh, two or three times in this presentation. The uh, option seven is God puts them in a realm where they can make a choice for or against God. Tim Stratton, in his blog post, What About Babies Who Die, on the Free Thinking Ministries blog, writes, quote, Many times when scientists are trying to make sense of the physical work, of the physical universe, they postulate ideas or the existence of other things that they do not have direct access to in order to make sense of everything they do have access to. Sometimes these postulations are confirmed in the future, and sometimes they are not, not, at least not yet. Sometimes these postulations are either falsified or come to be dismissed for other reasons. For example, uh, examples are postulating things like the multiverse, dark energy, the God, the God particle, a static block universe where temporal becoming is an illusion, the ether, and even evolution from a single-celled common ancestor. With that in mind, since the Bible is not clear as to what happens to infants when they die, I am going to make a speculative theological move and postulate an extra-biblical idea that is not anti-biblical. To be clear, I am uncomfortable with speculative theology, and I think we should only resort to this maneuver if all other options seem to have been exhausted. At this point, I see no other option if we are going to have a logically consistent, systematic theology. That is to say, the Bible reveals that God is perfectly just, righteous, loving, and good. With that in mind, how do we make sense of the fact that we know many babies die, over 50 million have been legally murdered in America just in my lifetime, since I am convinced that the objective purpose of human existence is to love God, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 38, and that true and maximal love requires the ability to make a free and informed decision and a true love relationship, marriage, with God is heaven, then since the Bible is not clear on the issue, I postulate the following. It could be the case that not all babies who die will necessarily go to heaven. However, it could be that all babies who die will get to eventually make a free choice if they want to be with God for eternity or not. This, is, this might be similar to the limbo view offered above, except the baby gets to be in a state of affairs where they get to learn and eventually make a free and informed decision. Uh, the baby would no longer be a baby, but rather a spiritual adult who is genuinely responsible and accountable for his or her decision. Thus, the baby does not experience irresistible grace, but does receive amazing grace to eventually make a free and informed decision, perhaps at an, epistemic's arm, an epistemic arm's length, as William Lane Craig described the angelic state of affairs, to love God for eternity or not, end quote. 
Like Dr. Stratton, I too am uncomfortable with this theological maneuver. However, since all of the other options are plagued with issues, and since <coughs> excuse me, the only problem that I can see with this alternative, the only issue it has is that it's speculative. That's the only thing it's got going against it. Since all the other ones have many problems with them, and since the only problem with this is that it's speculative, uh, it seems to me like the best explanation, or as I said at the beginning of this presentation, you can consider it the least bad explanation, if you prefer. I, I remember Eric Wielenberg in his debate with William Lane Craig on uh, what's the basis of morality. He said, uh, that he didn't he didn't find any explanations for why morality is objective to be uh, satisfying. He but and it, he he said he considered his own view uh, an inference to the least bad explanation. So if you don't like this, just consider it an inference to the least bad explanation, or the best explanation if you do like it. So we have covered. We're, we're done with. Pretty much most of this. We only have one week left to go uh, before we are done with the Hell series. And now it is Q&A time. I, I thought this was going to be an hour and 30 minutes, but I only went 12 minutes over. And, you know, it is so funny because last week I actually got, I actually got done really, really early. Instead of uh, going over or making it just in time, I, had, I was like 15 minutes early. Oh, well. So, now it is time for the comment section, the Q&A portion. Hello, SlamRN. Nice to have you with us. SlamRN says... Isn't that a little inconsistent if a woman sinner kills her children from a sinner, so they will certainly go to heaven? I refer the passed down sin. What are you referring to? Yeah, this is this is at eight twenty six p.m. So this was this was long. This was a long time ago. This this was a long time ago. Um, I, no, I don't think, I don't think, uh, well, especially based on my view, I think if, if a baby dies, they will just go to this realm where they're made cognitively, uh, cognitively uh, available, um, where they'll be able to make it inform a free and informed decision for, for or against Christ, um, and I don't think it is it is uh, morally permissible to kill a you know an, an infant or uh, an unborn child if they would go to heaven uh, because well I mean I already gave my re I, I gave that quote from uh, from my previous book on why I think that that objection against infant salvation doesn't work uh, you know for one thing God says not to kill and whether you know, take a life, that's his prerogative, not ours. But also, you know, you have uh, you have other things to consider, like the fact that we all impact each other's lives in so many different ways, as uh, the It's a Wonderful Life movie demonstrates. So, you know, you could, you could rob the world, you could, you could radically alter the course of events by depriving the the world of just one person I and mean, we don't know what those ramifications are because we don't have counterfactual knowledge like god does but you know that that, that would that, that's a you know that that's a reason i think to not to not be pro-choice even though yeah they they go to heaven you know it's assuming that that assuming that that's true um but also God is the author of life and only he has the right to take it. That's what Job 14, 5 and Psalm 139, 16 says. Um, he says, you must not murder. So that this argument, 
is is supposed to be a reductio ad absurdum to the uh, whole age of accountability infants go to heaven view um i don't think it works now i do think that there is uh, a serious objection and that is is that if infants do ought or infant or fetuses unborn or unborn children if they do go to heaven automatically upon their deaths then they're basically thrust into a relationship with God in the afterlife without ever having made a decision for or against him. And that kind of defeats the purpose of God giving us free will in whether we choose to accept the gospel or to embrace, uh, you know, or to reject it. As I said in the, the first one, I gave the illustration, uh, you know, of why free will is important to true love uh, let's say that it's the year 3000 you go down to the robo depot to get yourself a wife and the wife uh, and you know sh the the person who runs the the robo depot can program the robot to behave in any way you want uh, and it can do it, it says I love you 20 times a day it makes you breakfast lunch and dinner it cleans the house for you it never never leaves you for another person um, but you would realize this is not true love this is not her loving me this is really just my love to myself uh, being reflected back to me through this product I, I bought and had programmed in order for true love, in order for love to be true, it's got to be freely given. And uh, I talk about this also in my prob in my uh, my video that I uploaded on the logical version of the problem of evil. That's the problem I have with the automatic infant salvation view. I agree that the whole reductio ad absurdum. Oh, you'll be doing them a favor because they'll just go to heaven if you just go. Yeah, I agree. That argument does not work. But I do I do find the free will problem um to be a formidable objection against universal salvation now you could say well maybe god makes an exception for babies yeah but when you consider how many children have just just unborn children who have been murdered since roe v wade was legalized that's a lot of exceptions <clears throat> Mugen L says uh, that at 9 12 p.m., uh, these babies will stand before God at the great white throne judgment where they will be judged accordingly to their, to their acts. Yeah, I, that, that's what I, I, I quoted that. That's what I think that God, it, if they are, is this supposed to be a response against the you know, sort of pseudo limbo realm where they they have a, uh, the opportunity to choose for or against God. Because if, if they chose against God, um, conceivably, I don't know. Uh, this whole this whole view is speculative. So I would think most baby, I would think most babies who are made, you know, cognitively aware, sort of adult spirit beings. Um, I, I would not think that most of them would reject God, but conceivably, maybe some would. Um, I, you know, I don't know how that I don't know how that would work out. But if 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 one of them were to do that, that would be that would be a sin, and so that would be one of the things that they had done uh, written in the books, and so their book would not be written in the book of life, and they'd go to hell. But you know, assuming they say, yeah, God, I want to be with you, whatever that looks like, which, of course, you know, we don't know. I mean, the whole the whole option is speculative. Um, we don't know what that would we don't, we don't even know what that would look like. Would it be sort of a Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden type world where they would, you know, sort of a simulated Garden of Eden where they, you know, get to choose the, the knowledge of good and evil and the knowledge of the tree of life, something like that. I don't know. Um, 
if they do choose the tree of life, Jesus, um, their name will be in the book of life. And since they died before they got, they grew up and, you know, had any chance to do anything wrong, like sin or steal or commit idolatry, you know, n- nothing would be, they wouldn't have anything that they did that would be bad, that would be judge judgment worthy. Lugan L says, yeah, they, they must enter the lake of fire because they are still sons and daughters of Adam. The lake of fire is not a punishment. Whatever punishment that will fall upon those are the great white throne will be had at the judgment. In the end, they will be resurrected at the consummation. How how do you, how do you say that the lake of fire is not a punishment? I mean, I read Revelation twenty, and it seems like, by anyone's accounting, it seems like a punishment to me. Revelation chapter twenty, verses eleven to fifteen. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire and as i went into in my annihilation series there's good reasons to think that the lake of fire is the utter annihilation of those who are thrown into it um the um (laughs) you know it the john and god interpret the vision of being thrown into the lake of fire for us they say this is the second death, the lake, the lake of fire. That's what the lake of fire is. The lake of fire is the second death. Just like in, um, just like, hold on, let me share my screen here, um, because I've got Bible Gateway pulled up. Yeah, this, this is the second death, the lake of fire. They're going to die a second time. Um, just as you know, everybody experiences the first death, but Ro- Revelation two eleven says that those who belong to Jesus, the second death won't hurt them. Um, but we also saw in other places in the Bible, we talked, you know, the death of death. First Corinthians fifteen, Paul says, death will be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Uh, and what about the beast? Uh, the, you know, the beast. Uh, Daniel seven says will. Daniel 7 says that the beast will be killed and thrown into a river of fire. And that's obviously, you know, Paul, that's obviously a connection with Revelation 20. And it also points back to Daniel 2, where you have all these statues uh, that represent kingdoms. And a big boulder comes and shatters them all, destroys them. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're a preterist like me, you, you, you consider the fourth, the fourth kingdom, uh, to be Rome. Of course, you don't have to be a preterist to consider it Rome. You could say it's Rome sometime in the future if you're a, a futurist. Um, but yeah, death is destroyed, and death, you know, it in. Other places in scripture, death is, you know, the uh, fi- the final enemy to be destroyed. And then that death is thrown into the lake of fire. And the beast is destroyed in, in two Old Testament passages. Well, that lends support to the idea that the lake of fire is going to destroy the beast who's thrown into it. Uh, the beast is mentioned s- somewhere uh, in this chapter. And... Uh, Satan will be destroyed. The, the, the rulers, you know, the, the same passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that says that death will be destroyed, it says that um, the rulers and, and, and powers will be destroyed. Um, it says, um,
Yeah. Oh, um. Maybe I had the reference wrong. But yeah, I, it seems to me, I, I don't know why you would say that being thrown into the lake of fire is not a punishment. Whether you're a traditionalist and annihilationist or a universalist, it seems to me that this is a place to either be tortured forever, to be killed, or to be rehabilitated with sort of a, you know, remedial punishment. But it seems like no matter what view of, of, of hell you take, it seems rather implausible to say, no, this is not a punishment. Mugen El said, if the lake if the lake of fire is a punishment, then it would be unjust for everyone, regardless of their acts, to receive the same death sentence. Well, as um as I'm pretty sure that uh, Chris Date covered in his debate with Caleb Jackson that I hosted here on this channel, there are ways for, well, actually, you don't even need to hold the conditional immortality or annihilationism to even make this point. I mean, uh, but I am an annihilationist, and so I'm going to argue from that point of view. There are ways for the punishment, yeah, the, everybody ultimately ends up equally dead, but some people might suffer more than others in the process uh like we could say in the case of uh you know capital punishment in this world there's like lethal injection injection which is relatively painless um maybe completely painless there's the electric chair which is you know rather painful for the few seconds or, or minutes that you experience it there's the old act of crucifixion which was extremely agonizing and slow torturous death um there's being burned at the stake there's the firing squad not all of these have the same degree of pain but all of the people who are subject to them end up equally dead so in hell maybe god will keep some people alive longer to you know suffer more than other people you know maybe maybe the friendly grandma who didn't believe in Jesus uh, will will only suffer for like 30 seconds before she's snuffed out. While Hitler, it may take him half an hour before he goes, before he redu is reduced to ashes. Who knows? Also, Day, uh, and I do remember him saying this in the debate, that, you know, the pain pre-annihilation is not the only type of punishment um, that, that the wicked can uh, endure. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, which speaks of the resurrection of all people, says that some are raised to everlasting shame. And uh, uh, let's see, Daniel, Daniel 12, 2 says, um, and many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. And in uh, episodes of the Rethinking Hell podcast, he points out how this is not referring to, um, this is not referring to the people feeling shame, but it's referring to Isaiah 66. It's all, it's talking about the, the same thing Isaiah 66, 24 says, where they, the righteous looked at, look at the corpses of God's slain enemies being eaten by maggots and worms, and they look at them with disgust and, and loathing. Um, we we will remember Hitler very poorly in the age to come. We will hold him with everlasting contempt. Um, it, it will be a very shameful thing to go into the lake of fire and not be allowed into the kingdom of God. And back when Daniel was written and when Jesus and his apostles were reading this, this, this idea of shame was a lot more important to them. They're, we are not an honor shame culture. They were, and to some, and to honor shame cultures, to experience shame, that really is a fate worse than death. You know, think of the samurais in feudal Japan who who would kill themselves if it meant avoiding dishonor. So, the 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 fact that they know that they're going to experience shame, well, 
different people are going to be remembered differently. You know, I have some unbelieving friends and I hope that they become Christians before they, before they die. I, I'm trying my best to win them over. Uh, hopefully one of them is watching tonight uh, and has been watching this series. Um, I've been working on one guy who's been uh, visiting cerebral faith for many years. Um, but I'm going to remember them pretty well. They, they're pretty pleasant people and but i'm not going to remember hitler well or osama bin laden or joseph stalin no i i'm going to remember i'm going to hold them in a, a lot of contempt um but i'm not going to you know so there's different differing degrees of shame and contempt not everybody is going to be uh shamed uh, to the same extent, we might remember some of our unbelieving friends rather fondly um, in the age to come, but we're not gonna we're not gonna remember the Taliban that way or ISIS. So that's another. Way. There's pre-pain. There's the pain that comes before the annihilation, and some might experience more than that uh, before they go out. But there's also the post-annihilation thing. You know the that the damned will know about before they they go out of existence is that hey i'm i'm going to have a ba a really bad legacy left behind so there there's that this one guy says like duh Okay, so it looks like it looks like Moog and L and this one guy, you guys are having a conversation with each other. So if you have if you have questions, uh, please leave them in all caps in a in a semicolon, like 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 this like this. Yeah, just like this. Question, all caps, uh, colon, and then your question. Uh, if you're also going to be um, communicating with each other. That way I don't highlight a comment that's um, – that way I don't highlight comments and respond to comments that are not actually responding to me. Mugen L says, death is not a punishment, it's a confinement for lack of a better word, that holds you until the judgment to receive your reward or punishment. So you don't think capital punishment is a punishment? I know many societies and lawmakers that would staunchly disagree with you on that. Um, I think it's a punishment. I think being killed for a crime is a pretty harsh punishment. But that's just me. Mugin L says, how will God abolish death? He will abolish death because once the dead are raised, the death will, as an event, will not happen anymore. Um, the, the righteous will be given imperishable, incorruptible bodies, as Paul says, in um, 1 Corinthians 15. So we won't die anymore. We'll live forever, physically embodied. And, well, the damned won't die anymore because they will have been annihilated. You can't get any more dead than, as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, dead in both body and soul. So no one's going to die anymore. Death is not. Death will be no more. No one will die again. There will be no more funerals. There will be no more morgues. There will be no more um, urns with ashes in them, because no one's going to be no one's going to be dying anymore. The damn the wicked will will have been they will have been subject to divine capital punishment, as Jesus says in Matthew ten twenty eight. They will die death body of body and soul. They will be as Second Peter two six and Jude seven says. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah were incinerated and reduced to ashes, so will so will it be the ungodly. Sodom and Gomorrah being reduced to ashes, incinerated, served as an example for the ungodly on the day of judgment. 
And so, yeah, it's just not, it's not going to happen anymore. Um, you will never, you will never again hear the words, so-and-so died. That, that's, that's how death will be abolished. And, you know, I've had this, I've actually had this, um, this same exact objection brought up to me like two different times in the, um, on the Cerebral Faith YouTube channel. Uh, in the comments section, uh, the implication the, the implication is is that if people aren't uh, if if everyone is not being is not made immortal, then death is not really defeated. But I don't think that that's a, a very a very good objection because. As I uh, as I explained to this um, this one person here, if I can get it pulled up, I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Apparently, um, this this person here uh, asked the Yeah, she, th this person, Chad Anderson, asked if death dies, doesn't that mean that there will be no more death? If there's no more death, wouldn't that mean that everyone lives? Makes sense to me. And I responded, yeah, you can come to a lot of conclusions if you only look at one verse in any given place in the Bible. But good hermeneutics dictates we look at scripture in context, not just the context in terms of immediately pre preceding and proceeding passages, but the Bible as a whole. And as I point out in... Uh, in in the video I'm commenting on, in the previous video, the, the rest of the Bible emphatically states in a variety of different places and in a variety of different ways that not everyone will live. Interpreting this verse in light of the rest of Scripture's clear teaching on the topic, perhaps we should look for a different interpretation than everyone lives. One way to look at this is the set, it, that the redeemed will have imperishable, immortal resurrection bodies. Death as an event will never happen again. There will be no more morgues or funerals in the new heavens and the new earth because no one is going to die again. And as for the damned, well, they won't die again either because you can't get any more dead than being completely annihilated or death or destroyed in body and soul, as Matthew ten twenty eight puts it. So death as an occurrence will never occur again. The Real Steel Cat says, in a way, annihilationism scares me more than eternal conscious torment. In ECT hell, it is at least logically possible that one could repent, and we know that God, by his nature, responds to repentance. Well, tell that to the traditionalists who, who say that annihilationism is no big deal, because after all, you're just going to die, unlike eternal torment. Now, that's really scary. Um, you, you suffer forever, but you know, being burned alive and reduced to nothing forever, oh, that's, yeah, you know, no big deal. Um, and that certainly wouldn't be an effort to motivate me to evangelize my neighbor uh, who would suffer that fate. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want traditionalists to see this guy. You know what? I'm going to screen capture. I'm going to screen capture this because it's just, it's so ironic because so many, this was one of the non-biblical objections I talked about in um, part, in part four of this hell series, uh, the non-biblical objections to annihilationism is well. There was one that was, oh, it's not scary enough. It won't scare people into into the kingdom. It won't. Alexa, stop. It won't, won't scare people into the kingdom. It won't scare people to repent. It's just not horrifying enough. Uh, well, here's one person who I. I actually think annihilation is pretty scary, especially if it's a live cremation. And here's someone who actually agrees with me. This one guy says it would be too late to repent. Sadness. Well, I mean, post annihilation. Now, as I said in last week's uh, Q and A session, 
I am one of those conditionalists who, who is open to post-mortem conversion. People could people could repent in the intermediate state in Hades, Hades being uh, the place where the rich man was in, in Luke 16, whereas the redeemed are conscious in paradise, which is the place Jesus told the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43. Um, but I don't hold very, I don't hold hope that that's going to be the case with many, because as I said last week, we have biblical precedent for thinking that um, a, lot, a lot of people are just going to be, they're going to hate God, they're going to be hard hearted, they're going to be obstinate, and they're going to reject God they're, more and more as time goes on. Uh, think of the Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. He was subjected to plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. And yet the Bible says in several places that God, har that Pharaoh hardened his heart after ever after all of those plagues there are a lot there are a lot of verses that say pharaoh hardened his heart there are some verses that say pharaoh's heart was hardened without mentioning the cause and then there are verses that say uh god hardened pharaoh's heart but it doesn't mention uh the cause it doesn't it doesn't mention um you know how he did it uh maybe maybe he did it after Pharaoh hardened his heart a bunch of times and then God did it just the rest of the way, or maybe God hardened his heart as the apologetic study Bible footnote writer says, by continuously demanding him to let the Israelites go and sending these plagues. And so by in command, in demanding the, to let the Israelites go and sending plague after plague after plague, God, uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart in response to what God was doing. So in that way, God indirectly hardened his heart. But anyway, Pharaoh knew God existed. Pharaoh knew that God was superior to him, and he knew how to make his suffering and the suffering of his people cease. Just let the Israel, you know, let my people go. That's my Charlton Heston impression. Um, and yet he didn't do it. Not until his son died, and then, then even after that, he he decided to pursue the Israelites. We have uh, people in Revelation 16, 9, it says that God is afflicting them with plagues. And instead of repenting, these people curse God all the more. It says that they cursed God who had control over the plagues. It implies that they know God is punishing them. They know the reason why they are being punished. And yet, they do not repent. But curse God all the more. Uh, this this verse, Revelation 16, 9, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him the glory. Uh, so, and we have Satan. Satan has been rebelling against God for at least thousands of years. Uh so, Maybe we haven't, you know, depending on when you think the fall occurred, uh, how long ago, um, he shows no signs of repentance. By the time we get to the, the the Gospel of Matthew, he's still rebelling against God, and he knows God exists better than we do. Um, you have the Pharisees, who were so opposed to Jesus that they said that his work, his miracles, were the works of Beelzebub. Um, and just think, of, even without these biblical pres precedents, just think about it logically. If you hated someone and they were going to subject you to pain until you loved them and until you decided to do what they, what you wanted them to do, what, what would, what would your response be? You would probably hate them even more. That would probably just strengthen your dislike and your distaste of them. And, it, and the longer that goat went on, the more that would happen. I mean, if I hate, if I already hated someone to begin with, and they subjected me to pain until I did what they wanted to, that would probably, I mean, that would probably just make me hate them even more. And the more they afflicted me, the more I would hate them. And so I think, ironically, the universalist view of hell actually logically collapses into eternal conscious torment because you have these people 
who are just continually hard and getting harder and harder and harder of heart as, as time goes on. And they don't go out of existence because God's keeping his arms open. You know, I want you to repent, even though I know you never will, because you'll just keep hardening your heart. Um, and so they're just they're just in there forever. Wouldn't it be just better to annihilate them? This one guy said, you mean Sheol? Yeah, well, the Old Testament calls it Sheol. The New Testament refer, uh, refers to it as Hades. But yes, they're, ba they're basically the same thing. Lugan L says, if, if annihilation is true, then, uh, then death is immortalized. Well, how so? No one's going to be dying anymore. The Christians, and there's going to be many, many Christians, we are not ever going to die again. And as for the annihilated, well, they're never ever going to die again either. Because they're not going to exist anymore. You can't get any more dead than a death of body and soul, which is what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28. And I don't know how you make sense of that other than to say well destroy doesn't really mean destroy it just means to be ruined and of course we did the whole word study in part two of this hell series to show why that there's only like a few handful of verses where it could mean something like ruined or lost but the vast majority of verses like apollomy mean just plain old destruction or death or dying or something of that you know something of that sort A good Q and A session we're going. We've got going. Um, I'll probably, I'll probably cut it off at um, at two hours uh, rather than an hour and a half. We're already going on one hour and forty seven minutes. But this is a good. Um, this is uh, this is good back and forth we're having. It's a good good Q and A session. <clears throat> um, and by the way. If you want to see the debate between the universalist um, Caleb Jackson and the traditionalist, I mean, uh, the conditionalist Chris Date, uh, you can check that out here on the channel on Cerebral Cerebral Faith Video. I didn't I didn't live stream it. I uploaded it. I would have live streamed it, but I just didn't think, uh, you know, I didn't. I, I originally only planned to have it on the pot, the Cerebral Faith podcast, but I didn't. Um, I decided to put it on YouTube at the last minute, and then by then it was too late to advertise it. So I, I just thought, hey, I'll upload it. Most people are not going to be able to watch it live anyway. But in future debates that I moderate, I will. Um, I will have it up live. <clears throat> okay, sorry for that moment of silence. <clears throat> uh, I've been doing a lot of talking tonight. And L says, if death is abolished by life, not by the prevention of any more dying. If Christ came tomorrow and caused all who are currently living to never die, did he abolish death? No. But if he comes back and eventually raising all who have died, that is the abolishment of death. Well, I just I just can't agree with that. I don't think that that's a good argument. Um <clears throat> It, it seems to me, I mean, I can see how you're viewing death as being defeated, but as I, as I told this 
uh, this one person on the Cerebral Faith Facebook page. This is how I responded to uh, this is how I responded to that person. I said, I see no reason to think that death is not conquered just because some of the damned are annihilated and not made immortal. To use an analogy, was Thanos not really defeated by the Avengers because not every single one of his victims was able to be snapped back to life, i.e. Gamora and Natasha Romanoff, who were sacrificed for the Soul Stone in Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, respectively? No. We would say Thanos is a defeated foe, regardless of the fact that he still took down three people, uh, namely Gamora, Natasha, and uh, technically Tony, since he, he died in order to defeat Thanos. Another analogy, if a serial killer had killed 20 people before the cops could, could get to him and the judge sentenced him to death, would we not say that the serial killer in being captured and executed was not a defeated foe just because his victims didn't come back? No, of course we wouldn't. In the case of the serial killer, he's defeated because he won't be able to take any more victims. I also uh, gave uh, an, uh, a thought experiment involving aliens. Let's say that uh, aliens came down uh, and they had a they had a cure for COVID nineteen. Um, they said, "Hey, you know, we have." Uh, this this thing this COVID nineteen that you're dealing with we dealt with that on our planet a long 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 time ago and we we just have this simple pill that it, it, you take it as soon as you take it uh, if you if you have coronavirus it will go away um, and so but now if everybody and you can eradicate COVID nineteen from the planet if everyone on the face of the earth takes this pill at exactly the same time uh, tomorrow, like 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and so on, you know, tomorrow, uh, everyone takes this extraterrestrial miracle pill, and just like that, it's as though COVID-19 never even existed. Now, the aliens in this thought experiment, you know, they're not gods. They're not going to bring any of the victims of coronavirus back to life. Nevertheless, would you say that COVID-19 had won? Would you not say that the virus was really defeated because it had already taken victims, victims who would not be returning? I wouldn't. Would you say that if everyone is, it, would you say that if everyone is permanently in a state of death, it seems to me that the coronavirus has won. When you look at the verses about there not being any more death, it really seems to me that death as a continuing effect is, is what's in view here. Just look at Revelation 21.4. Quote, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. End quote, CSB. But just as the wicked will continue being dead, more dead than they've ever been, death of uh, being dead in body and soul, Matthew 10, 28, it will also be the case that people won't uncry or ungrieve or that pain won't be real past experiences. No, it will be the case that people in the past have cried, people in the past have grieved, have grieved and people in the past have experienced pain. It's not as though Jesus is going to go back in time and stop Adam and Eve from eating the forbidden fruit, eating... Um, therefore preventing a future, uh, creating a future where every bad thing never happens. Rather, what Revelation 21-4 uh, seems to be saying is that all of these things, death, crying, mourning, pain, will never happen again. You will never experience pain. You will never experience crying you will never experience grief, and you will never experience death. Death is a defeated foe. No one will experience it ever again. Death will be no more. The Real Steel Cat says, gotta go to bed. May everyone still in here in the eastern time zones be blessed with melatonin too. Well, good night. I'm about to cut it off. We're going on a... Me 
an hour and 55 minutes, but this was a really, uh, this was really a good Q and a session. I'm not going to be able to, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to respond to every, uh, every comment. So, but yeah, this is, the, this is probably the most Q and a, this is probably the most interaction on cerebral faith live I have ever gotten. And it's really, really great. Mugen L says, I am going to kickstart a YouTube channel so I can hopefully discuss with you on this topic. Great discussion. Okay, I look I look forward to it. Um, I'm going to go now. I I need it's it's getting late. It's almost 10 p.m. <clears throat> um but come back next week and we will look at the uh we will wrap up the section on hell. Uh we will look at the the question, why would God create those whom he knew would reject him? And that's going to be next week, Monday, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you for watching Cerebral Faith Live. To support this ministry financially, go to www.patreon.com slash cerebral faith. And for more apologetics, Blog, uh, for more apologetics content, blogs, podcasts, and videos, check out www.cerebralfaith.net. Thank you for watching. Peace out. God bless. And I will see you next time. And keep using the brains that God gave you.